electromagnetic field. Largest earthquake of the last day was in the Indian Ocean, but in relevance will come back to the United States once again. Their above average rumbles continued to surprise, much like happened last year during the lead up to the magnitude 7 in California. I wish I could say it was a different story this year, but it's looking exactly the same. Not necessarily for Ridgecrest, not ruling that out either, just in general out west, we're as above average on the west coast as last year, if not worse. We've got no better news here on the weather front for the United States, other than that the seismic and storm risks are going to be on opposite sides of the country. Like yesterday, I strongly advise checking your forecast as this could get very bad tonight, all while many regions west and north of it are forecast to break cold and snow records. And that's depressing, so let's take our minds off this and ponder if there are any other species finding their advancement tedious. If some intelligent ones were nearby, wouldn't it be great to talk to them? In a new work, they sought to dive deeper into Drake-like equations than ever and concluded that several civilizations like ours or more advanced exist in the galaxy today, with the closest being potentially only 7,000 light years away. It's most likely to be around a low mass dwarf star, and the problem is, even 7,000 light years being just a hop, skip, and a jump inside the galaxy, it's still way beyond communication ability at present. Even if we could detect them there for certain, we just can't touch that reality yet. But what if we could? What are the first generation of star explorers going to look like? Will they have massive rocket boosters on the back? Maybe, probably. But it might also have something tremendously unfamiliar to most of you, a string. A space tether experiment unrolled a 12 mile long conductive wire with a satellite on the end of it many years ago. The mission ended dramatically as electric currents, vastly beyond their wildest imaginations, surged through and melted the wire. The experiment failed, but it told them what's really up there, energy. They're finally beginning to publish their next ideas for how to use all that space energy to move a spacecraft. Their first attempt is going to be to use the current in the tether to increase orbital altitude and speed without firing a single rocket. Up next, the center of the galaxy, Sagittarius A. First it was the near-infrared brightness event, then rumors of increasing X-ray brightness, and now it's official in the Astronomy and Astrophysics Journal. The bright flaring increase is confirmed. Now, while many might have expected a sudden flash and galactic superwave in such a situation, it does appear as though the procedure is a bit more drawn out. Stronger flares, stronger X-ray events, more often, but a slow ramp up, hopefully not leading to a Fermi bubble-sized crescendo, if you know what I mean, because that would be bad. Anyway, folks, bit of backstory. There's a satellite that tracks pre-earthquake electromagnetic signals. Their mission papers cited our own peer-reviewed work. There's a full textbook out on pre-earthquake electromagnetism, and indeed the Earth tends to give herself away in these seismic events so very often. Over at QuakeWatch.net, we employ the known science to real-world data, and while we're nailing 90% of the big ones in an average of 10% alert coverage, that's still not good enough for alerts to action for governments, and we're finding the exact same situation here. Dr. Hellman updating the magnetic rock stress method and remarking it's where our model is, showing every sign of reality, but not quite finely tuned enough for action. Either way, three cheers for the concept that it's magnetism that triggers the earthquake. Golf clap. By the way, we get remote sensing data on that front from the ground up to the electrified layers of space, and it's very, very useful. And that goes all the way up to the ionosphere. And this is where that energetic interaction breaks into affecting the climate as well through a space weather modulation of the total electron content through the vertical atmospheric column. And when examining the critical frequencies of various layers of the ionosphere, you can only conclude that only a penetrating electric field from that same space weather could be causing the effects that you see during solar storms. And once again, that will easily be able to get integrated into the global electric circuit.